grace to trust Him more. Yeah, well, that's easy to say amen to, but it's it's a different thing in life. Praise God. Hi, Pat. I'm still here, and you're still there. And uh, and Michael and Brandy, if you're watching tonight, I just heard from my wife that you were watching on Thursday night. God bless you. And uh, there have been a Bible study that we're teaching. Well, they are the Bible study people that we're teaching, one of them. And uh, so God bless you. Welcome to Antioch, the Apostolic Church. Oh, please be seated. God bless you. Sorry I was in Indiana there for a minute. <laughs> oh, for grace to trust him more. You know, I really, I think I really am more suited sometimes to talking to a group of uh, leaders and aspiring leaders than anything else. And if I, w- if I were in that context right now, I would definitely follow that trail about asking for more grace. And I would have a quick group discussion and find out how, uh, let's say, um, really attached to that thought and prayer the audience was. And how knowledgeable they are of that subject. And, you know, it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't written by somebody that took things lightly in the kingdom of God. Speaking of which, let me say this. I'm fired up now. Um... I, uh, listen, I don't care. I don't care if you've got holes in the bottom of your shoes. I've been there. I've sat on the platform of Antioch, the Apostolic Church, with holes in the bottom of my shoes with cardboard stuck in them. Not recently, thank God. And, uh, but uh, it got so bad to one particular brother in the church that he called me, or he told me after church, and he said, can you meet me at such and such an address? And I said, for what? He says, it's about a soul. I had no clue what he was talking about, so I thought we were going to go see one of his friends, and we, the address was a shoe store. Can you imagine how good God is? I don't care how raggedy your clothes are. I don't care. I don't care how raggedy your car is. You ought to see the rental car that I drove down in here. It's raggedy. It's awesome. I love it. The seats are so dirty. I, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to buy fried chicken one day and just... Eat on the way. With no, no regrets. I haven't done it yet. But the errant french fry will cause no damage. No further damage. I don't care if your fenders are flapping. I don't care. I don't care about that. I don't care if you're cutting corners at every, you know, at every opportunity. I know, I know how it feels. I know. I, believe me. But I'll tell you one thing, don't you ever do anything cheap in the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about materials. I'm talking about don't even think about something compromised and cheap and in ministry. Don't do it. That's not who you are. That's not what you're called to be. Praise God. Oh, those guys left. Okay. This was one of those nights I could have had him just singing that one song all through the thing. I'm trying to think of what's the, what the words of it. All of my life you've been so faithful. Oh, that just, I, I choked out the first couple rounds and then finally, you know, finally was able to sing it. But my goodness. I don't know if, I don't know if it's, maybe it's just preachers in general. I know it's me. But, you know, when you have some kind of inkling of what you're going to say and whatever the exhortation may be, the direction that God's given you in the word of the Lord or the move of the Spirit or whatever it is, and then these songs are going right along with it, it's just the most amazing dynamic that goes on. And to tell you the truth, you kind of want to just get up there and go (laughs) while you're singing because it's so awesome. So well done, guys. Well done. And you guys did well, too. You know that expression, I feel you? Well, I felt you. So, And if I felt you, I think Jesus felt you, too. Okay, here's the deal. 
What have I forgotten? Thanks for doing this, pastor and crew and assistants and leaders. Thanks for showing up on, uh, on Friday and Saturday especially. We had a, had a good time, I think, and um, it's always a pleasure to, to talk to people that want to move forward. And it's a bummer to talk to people that are just stalled in the way. It really is. I mean, if they're not going to change, you know, we just need dynamite at that point, and let's move on. Is that little that little thing the little stand isn't here? Is it? Well, bring it. Yeah, let's. I'm gonna go down here. I want to. This is more like teaching anyway, so I want to get close. Thank you, sir. Ow. 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 Thank you. Easy peasy. Okay. <laughs> This uh, subject started out for me as a summary of what I thought uh, were the ingredients, the necessary ingredients of what I called the Jerusalem Revival. For me, as you know, the Jerusalem Revival begins in Acts chapter 2 by effectively chapter 6, and you can throw 7 in, for, but it's just Stephen preaching, but from 2 to 6 is the whole content of the Jerusalem Revival, that's it. So we always, you know, shout about our roots and, you know, back into the book of Acts church and all that. Well, it starts in Jerusalem, and like I said, in just a few chapters, it's, everything shifts. And it shifts because of persecution. It shifts because of the movement of the, of the church members, etc., and the focus on the expansion of the church as well. So what I found a long time ago, many years ago, and some of you have probably heard me hit these points in that context in those days about the essential elements, if you will, of the Jerusalem revival. And I called those kind of the, kind of the uh, well, like I said, the, the, the growth stages of that particular revival. It kind of evolved. I, you know, it's not, it wasn't something, it was, you know, and let me, tell you, let me tell you what this thing tonight is not, okay? Let me make it easier if I tell you what this is not. This is not a list of seven things that I've conjured up that seem very clever, and they all begin with the same letter, nope. And it's not something I got out of a book except for the Bible, and it's not something that I borrowed from somebody else. And it's not something that is just for tonight, and then I'm going to forget about it, and it just seems like a clever thing to do, okay? It's none of those. These are still principles that I find that were absolutely essential and foundational in the church in the church's birth and the church's expansion. In fact, it all started there and it had to develop in a certain fashion. Now, it's gone from just the Jerusalem revival in my brain and my thinking and in my, the way that I look at things. And now it's, I've, I've taught it in Africa as principles or almost like a checklist, since I'm a pilot, it's almost like principles or, or a checklist for national leaders and pastors and, and those kind of types. I, I really wanted them to have a, a kind of a, an idea of the things that were elementary and things that were foundational to that initial revival of the primitive church. But it just keeps evolving and I just keep ruminating over this. And more recently, I've just decided that these things are, could be called the characteristics of the early church. And I have since added a seventh. There were six before, there are now seven, and I've run out of chapters. So I'm, I'm, I, right now, the list for me ends at seven. It can go on and on and on as long as you want to take it and you want to just meditate on it. But what I think and what, I, what I'm throwing out tonight is this list of seven things, one thing in each chapter of the first seven chapters of the book of Acts that, again, I find are absolutely essential characteristics in the healthy apostolic book of Acts church that we have descended from. Okay? That's what this is. There will be a test. 
Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive. This is, a, this, is, you know, this is Luke writing to his friend Theophilus. And he's, re, he's reminding him of how this thing all started. Verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That sounds exactly like the end of the, the, the gospels, exactly like the end of Luke. Who was writing this one? And being assembled together, verse 4, with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. And then red letters, if you've got a red letter Bible. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Still like the end of the Gospels. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now listen, listen to their response to this wonderful announcement. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time then restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, what are they really asking, people? What are they really asking? I know this is church, but you can still shout it out if you feel so inclined. What are they really asking about? They're asking about a kingdom that Jesus is not talking about at all. They're looking for the restoration of the powerful uh, presence and, and uh, historical importance and the kingdom of David restored and all this. They're looking for Israel to be great again. They're looking for an overthrow of the oppression that's from the Roman government and from the Jewish corrupt leadership. They're looking for something like that. Not only are they looking for that, they're also still pensively considering their places in the hierarchy of this, of this kingdom that Jesus is going to create. That's how distorted their view was, even as late as Luke's rendition here in Acts chapter 1. I mean, the bottom line is that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they never really got it. They, got, they had sprinklings of, of inspiration, and they had moments of revelation. And then they had huge lapses of understanding of what really was going on. And so that's still represented here in Acts chapter 1. So John truly baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many well, so is this now you're going to restore the kingdom? Finally now, and you're the risen Christ, and it's all ready, and we went through the tomb thing, and the empty tomb, and 40 days, and, and, and he says unto them in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you theologians. But what he's saying is, listen guys, there's some things you simply do not need to know. There's stuff you don't need to know. Let me put it this way. There's stuff that doesn't even need to be preached. <laughs> Woo! Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> There's stuff that doesn't need to be preached. I don't know how some of these guys can even live. You know, predicting this and predicting this and prophesying this and predicting this. And then with no accountability looking in the rearview mirror. Wrong, 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 wrong. It's, it has nothing to do with what Jesus wants to do in and through the church today. Nothing. You just don't need to know everything, guys. Don't worry about that. Leave that with the Father. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Listen, which the Father hath put in his own power. That's not dunamis, that's exousia. You know the dunamis exousia thing, okay? There's some power that's translated exousia, which means authority. And there's some powers that are from dunamis, which means power. This is, a, this is authority. This has nothing to do with your authority. This has nothing to do with your authority. You have no authority over this. You have no authority over the times or the seasons that he's chosen to do these things. You, <laughs> you have no authority over these things. You don't command God how to run his kingdom. You don't do it. It doesn't work because he lives in the office which on the door says, God. This is his kingdom. 
Now where you have authority is in following His will as He pursues His own will and carries out the building of His, of his kingdom. That's where you fit in. And therefore, so the Father has put this in His own authority, not, not the times and the seasons are not for us. But you shall receive dunamis. You're going to receive the power of God to do what? To carry it out. You'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Right. So what do they do? Well, they mess up again because as he's speaking this, there he goes. And what do they do? Whoa, look at that. And what do we do now? And they just absolutely forgot what he just told them. So angels have to come and say, why are you standing here staring up into the sky? Go to Jerusalem and wait, like he said, for the promise of the Father. So they go. Number one stage, number one characteristic, number one principle that the early church had to get engaged in, and that is separation. Separation. They had to come out from everybody else, and they had to be willing to be different. Separation. In the leadership discussion over over the weekend, we talked about positioning oneself for usefulness. That's it. Separation. I'm separating myself from my life, and I'm giving myself to the will of God however He wants to use it. I'm going to do like He says. I don't have to know the end from the beginning. He takes care of that. But I have to know that He's calling me out. He's calling me out. I'm going to be separated for His purpose. Where it leads, that's the journey. I love calling it the journey. That's my latest thing. It's calling it the journey because it's a journey. It's an adventure. Join the Navy and see the world. Well, that's nothing compared to being in the kingdom of God. You talk about a journey. He'll send you places. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you ever been to Dubai a Lubwe? I have. Woo! I've been to Louisa. Sounds like a woman's name, Louisa, but it's not. Praise God. Man. I mean, just separation. I'm going to put stuff down, and I'm going to step out. I'm going to leave some stuff behind, realizing that if this is going to be real for me, I've got to be separate from that. I've got to trust Him. I've got to trust Him for more grace. Whatever that entails. Chapter number 2. Day of Pentecost comes. They're in an upper room. They're praying. They're they starting to get it into gear now. They're praying. They're praying for this promise of the Father that Jesus reminded them of. They're praying about it. Suddenly one day, boom, it comes. There it is. Bang. They're having such a time in this upper room praying and speaking in other tongues, unknown tongues, known tongues. 17 different languages are pouring out of these Galilean folks. Nobody down below that can hear this ruckus can make any sense of it. How, what is this? Are these people just crazy? Somebody says, well, they must be drunk. And Peter stands up with the 11. 14, 214. But Peter standing up with the 11. I don't think I ever even noticed that till tonight. I mean, I know Peter stood up, but he stood up with the 11. It's like all of, all of a sudden, 12 guys stand up. I don't know if they were sitting down praying. I don't know if they were kneeling on the floor. I don't know what they were doing. But suddenly, when this guy says, Well, these men must be drunk, 12 guys stand up. Man, I would have been on my feet if I were you. This front row stuff. These guys are drunk. Up, 12 guys. Boom. 12 guys. And Peter standing up with the 11. Boom. And then Peter starts talking. Peter starts talking. And one, on one end, you say, well, that makes sense because he's always the big mouth anyway. <laughs> True enough. And he's still going to be a big mouth, but now it's going to be, it's going to be moved by God. It's good. <laughs> and of all things, I mean, picture this. And the 12 guys, oh, we're not drunk. And Peter said, these are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that 
Come on, Peter. Which was spoken by the prophet. Who? Who? That little bitty scroll that we heard 14 years ago in the synagogue. And he quotes Joel from out of the blue. Why? Because he's full of the Holy Ghost. For a moment, the first moment in his life, he gets some kind of inkling about who he really is. You don't know what you really are or who you really are until God starts using you the way he wants to use you. Because you have what? Separated yourself. You've made yourself ready. I'm not like, I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm going to be me, Daryl Savage. I'm going to be me, like we were talking about before, sir. I'm going to be me, and God's going to use my personality, and God's going to use my desire, and God's going to use my zeal, and He's going to give me more grace, and I'm going to find out who I really am. You ever heard these these dumb, you know, sports guys talk? I mean, not that not just the the announcers are really dumb, but the players are even dumber. You know, and the broad the broadcast, the, the interviewer always has to put words in their mouth. How does it feel to know that the coach is feeling so nice and talking to you in the locker room and, to, and meeting on you with every Wednesday? How does it feel? And, you know, how does that make you feel warm? And the guy says, oh, it makes me feel really warm, and I'm glad that the coach is, you know. What is this? Drivel. And then some of these guys are they're so well, I'm just out, I'm giving a hundred percent and I'm doing I'm doing all this stuff, you know. And then 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 you hear the veteran commentator say, that's nice for him to brag about that. But you what what you what the, the real guy the real guys that have been there and done it, they don't want to hear you before the stuff. They want you to do your stuff. And what do they say? Let your play speak for you. Well, I'm going to juke and jive and I'm going to do, you know, and then pow. You know, you don't know who you are until you get out there. But here's the thing. This is the army of the living God. This is the movement. This is the movement that since the from the beginning of time, God has looked for the... The outpouring of the Holy Ghost, that's a big deal. On God's chronometer, that's a big deal. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years go by. It's been, they've had 400 silent years. You know, still John the Baptist shows up. And then, you know, three years of him and three years of Jesus. And, and, and it's, been, it's been thousands of years of just people not getting it. And now he pours out his spirit on people. So we're getting to number two here in Acts number two. Revelation. I mean, suddenly they had a revelation that the time, the time is now. When's the revival begin? Now. What time is re- now? What are we doing? What's the church doing now? What's the church? The church is doing revival now. The church is in revival now. Here's the thing. We're not waiting for anything. You're not waiting for some season to come. God's waiting on our season to come. When we show up, it's the revelation. They needed a revelation. Acts chapter 3. Things take a turn in Acts 3 because at the end of chapter 2, it says, without any kind of distinction of who's involved, it says that, that signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostles, but it doesn't say what and it doesn't say who. But in Acts chapter 3, everything comes to a grinding stop on one man. Peter and John at the beginning of the chapter go into the temple to pray. Go into Solomon's porch to pray with the other disciples and the other other Christians. And suddenly they're passing the same guy that they passed him a hundred times. The Bible says he was laid at the gate called beautiful every day. They've gone by this guy hundreds of times pre-salvation, post-salvation, they see him at the same gate every single day. But one day they stop. One day God stops Peter and John in their tracks because the Holy Ghost says, Stop! 
Stop and look at this guy the way you're supposed to look at this guy. So they stop. (laughs) And he puts up his hand to receive the coin. Because they stopped and they're looking at him. And obviously they're going to give him something. Silver and gold I don't have. But here it comes. He feels that same day of Pentecost thing. Woo. But such as I have. Oh, yeah. And John's going, go, man. Yeah, such as I have. John says, let me take over. Now, this is mine. Peter says, this is mine. Such as I have, boom, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You talk about boldness. Come on, Benny Hinn. Come on, you can do better than that, man. You don't see him just reaching down and, you know, lame man, pick him up, rise up and walk, and then he just do, 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 do. Uh-uh. It's like some kind of weird, protracted, you know, staged, dramatic theme that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Not Simon Peter. Boom, in the name of Jesus Christ. So the third thing in Acts chapter 3 is what? Participation. Personal participation in what God is doing right now. Right now. Okay, so here's what I'm saying. I'm saying these, I'm calling these seven things, these are principles. These are principles that are necessary for the church to be apostolic like we claim to be. And the third one is personal participation in the work of spiritual ministry. Who does it? This is time for group discussion again. Who does it? It's for whom? Every single member of the body of Christ. Because effectively, if you're you're saying, well, that's not in me, then what you're saying is the Holy Ghost is not in me. Where do we get compassion? Where do we get vision? Where do we get understanding? Where do we get a a feeling of of love and charity and, and service? Where do we get that? It's His Spirit. And He's baptized every one of us with that Spirit. Participation. Things go really well for a while, like just minutes. Because in just a little while, maybe hours, maybe in, in a little while, there all of a sudden there's, there's people that have seen this tremendous miracle and there's thousands gathering. There's thousands gathering to figure out what, and to ask what's going on and how is it happening. The offshoot of that, of course, in chapter 4 is the very first persecution of the church. They tried to shut them down. It's persecution time. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the move of God. Welcome to more grace. Because it usually involves some kind of persecution. Now, not necessarily, you know, people aren't shooting poisonous darts at you here. Probably not. I know that there's some other weird things going on in America that I can't understand except it's pure evil. I get that. But there's not some kind of direct persecution by some kind of bunch of people against the people of the living God. Not open. You know, this isn't China yet. But modern 21st century American persecution is alive and well. It just takes a different form. Anything that holds you back, anything that makes you feel funny in doing anything in ministry, any any kind of inside or outside spirit that wars against you and, and, and somehow persuades you not to be who God wants you to be, that's persecution. It's stopping the move of God in you. And when it stops the move of God in you, it stops the move of God in the body of Christ. Not only that, but it becomes infectious. Because if I see everybody else just kind of doing the normal, kind of the minimum thing, I show up and I worship, I love God, I pay my tithes, I dress right, and I don't drive a funny car. And I'm okay, and obviously God is blessing me, so I'm all right. So then I come in, and I come in under that vision, and that's the majority of the church. So guess what? That's my standard as well. Now you welcome me into the crowd because I'm doing just like you are. We're all one big happy family that doesn't put pressure on anybody else. But that's not the move of God. That's not being spirit-led. 
Because God singles us out. He singles us out. Personal participation. Now, here's number four. Persecution comes up. So what do we do? How do we answer persecution? Simple. The big D word, determination. They threaten them. And they, 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 I mean, they lay them out. They say, you, you're not going to do this. In fact, specifically, specifically, here's what they ask. By what, they asked the apostles, by what power, I love this, by what power or by what name have you done this? Remember I was talking to you guys, some of you leaders, about the you know, people that call on the name. That's what it was all about. By what name have you done this? Have you done this in the name of the Sanhedrin? No, obviously. We didn't give you that authority. Did you do this in the name of the king? No. Did you do this in the name of the, of the nation of Israel? No. And then in what name and what authority caused you to do this? So Peter preaches a little bit. And he tells them that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. That's the, authority, that's the name that we're doing this. So they said, well, we're going to shut it down. And we forbid you, that's what it says, we forbid you to speak or preach in that name. You can do whatever you want to. You can open up a popcorn stand on any corner in Jerusalem. But don't preach or teach in the name of Jesus. We're shutting it down. So they go back and they get the church together and they get into a prayer meeting at the end of chapter 4 and they pray and they pray a wonderful prayer. You ought to almost memorize, you ought to get the, at least get the elements of this prayer. And when they heard these threats, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And here's what they prayed. Lord, you are God, and you're the one that made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They, they rallied together against the Christ that was sent from heaven. For of a truth against your holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and and Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do what? To kill him. But here's what they pray. What they did, they gathered together to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. All these enemies, with all their threats, even to the point of killing Jesus on a cross, the only thing they were doing is carrying out the will of God. So they remind God of what He's already done. But listen, when you remind God in your prayer, you're not reminding God. You're reminding you. Because it takes guts to say stuff like that. More grace. More grace. It does not, it's not pixie dust from heaven. More grace means an open door for you. And then it, oh, whoa. And then you get to look through the door and it's not so great on the other side. And God says, go. That's more grace. Oh, should I go? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Because, how do you know? Because God opened the door and God said, go. But I don't know. I've never been there before. It's okay. It's called grace. He gives you what you need, so go. And then when you go and everything assails your entrance, everything comes against you in entering that new door and that new stage and that new, that new, that new calling and that new ministry of you. When everything comes against you, what do you do? You take it back to God and you remind Him that He sent you. But you're not reminding Him. You're reminding yourself that He sent you. And it takes guts. nation you're going to have persecution you're not going to feel like doing all these great things it's easy to sing about them it's easy to rejoice over somebody else's testimony but you need your own so they prayed did they, all they did was whatsoever your counsel determined before to be done and now now Lord now having stated that, categorically, having stated now, Lord, now behold their threatenings. They're telling us to stop what you said to do. Is anybody here tonight? Man, I mean, you look absolutely dragged out. 
You're either listening with 110% attention or I mean you're unplugging because this is just too tough. Now, Lord, look at the threatenings. Now, Lord, we're bringing the threat, we're bringing the persecution and laying it at your office door, God. And what do we specifically pray for? Be careful as you read this. Be careful. Don't get it wrong. Get it right. Get it right. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant us what? Grant us, grant to your servants that with what? With all boldness they may speak your word. And then they add the, by stretch, the boldness for them comes by God stretching forth his hand and doing things. They are not asking him to just do things and wow all the people. They're asking them, God to, to give them boldness by continuing to stretch forth his hand and do whatever miraculous thing he chooses. Whatever miraculous thing he chooses. Whatever miraculous thing he chooses. Or what he chooses not to do. He doesn't have to answer your prayer for the miraculous. He doesn't have to do that. You can command this leg to be made whole all you want to, but if it's out of the will of God, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But if you ask anything according to His will, it's going to happen. So why don't we do what? Let's find out what the will of God is. How do you do that? You participate. Like in Acts 3. You participate in Acts 3. And then guess what? He brings you into Acts 4. And now you got to live up to the task with determination. Because somebody's going to stop you. And it may not be anybody else but you. So they have this great prayer meeting. The house is shaking. Awesome. I mean, it's a tremendous thing. And there they go out. And boom, they, I mean, they crush it in Jerusalem. Thousands come in. Thousands come in. And then we get to chapter number five. Whew. And you talk about stuff coming to a grinding halt. It comes to a screeching halt in, in Jerusalem. Yes. Who did that? I thought I heard some. It was a baby? That's like the dog. I said screeching halt, and the baby goes, Ew. I love preaching here. Because there's always somebody. Anyway. It comes to a, are you ready? It comes to, it comes to a screeching halt. Screeching, I mean, dead stop. Funny, because at the end of chapter 4, things are just cooking with oil. I mean, it's going, it's going great. I mean, it was going great. Now people are selling things and bringing bags of money and laying them at the apostles' feet and and just do what you want. I just this is this. I mean, who cares? You know, here, you know, we're just ready. <laughs> and then five. But there's this guy named Ananias. You know the story if you've been in your Bible very much. Ananias and his wife Sapphira. And they're they're in a they're in an absolute dilemma because they they've they've sold a property and they want to give some money that makes it look like they're doing what everybody else is doing. They're in the they're in the same spirit, you know, but they don't really want to give it all. So why not just tell the pastor, why don't they just tell Simon Peter, hey, I sold this thing and I don't want to give it all, but I want to give you this. And Simon Peter would say, bring it, bring it. And he would have had you testify after the, after the other guy who gave it all. It would have been awesome, but no way. He's got to fit in by some other standard. He wants to fit in to this group that is separated and is revelated, and is participated, and is determinated. I know I'm making him up. He wants to participate without paying the price. So he's going to keep this, and his dog, he's going to do it by, by a ruse. And nobody will ever know. Yeah, right. You forgot about the office with the thing that says God on it. Who's in direct communicado with Simon Peter? So he brings it. Here it is. Immediately, Peter said, what in the world are you doing? How in the world did you determine to lie to the Holy Ghost? I can just imagine Ananias. You know, 
Can you? Oh, man. One of the worst feelings of my entire life. This is going to sound funny and crazy. And don't get spooked out. I woke up from a dream. In the dream, I, I <laughs> hear me, okay, closely. I, 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 I had, I, it didn't happen in the dream, but I had, I feel bad telling this. Maybe I shouldn't tell it. I, I didn't do it in the dream, but I, had, I suddenly had become an adulterer. That's what. It's happened, I've had one dream like that. I, I did, there was no woman involved or any. I mean, it's just, all of a sudden in my dream, I'm an adulterer. And suddenly I have this, I, I, I have this, I can't tell you how empty I was. I mean, I was just undone completely. And I woke up, boom. And I'm thinking, whew. I'm thinking, wait, 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 I'm in bed. I got Pat right next to me. I'm still me. I'm clean. Oh, God have mercy. That was the purpose of the dream, I guess. I mean, I, I wasn't having any. Anyway, never mind. I, I was good. But boy, the feeling. Ananias didn't have that luxury. All he knew was, Psh, I'm stripped, man. He, he dies. God kills him on the spot. His wife comes in later. <laughs> Poor gal. She's just trying to do what her husband tells her. You know, be the obedient Jewish woman of Jerusalem. And you know, now when you get there, make sure you tell, you know. So, uh, did you sell it for, uh, yes, that's what we did. Boom, boom, she's dead. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 and verse whatever it is, verse 11, great fear comes upon all the church, upon as many as heard these things. So what's this one, Grossbach? What's number five? Number five is illumination. There was an illuminating spirit and light that was shown on the body of Christ to let them know, to let them know as a body that you could have, you could have revival or you could allow hypocrisy, but you can't do them both. You can't do it. The Spirit of God will illuminate the body of Christ. Why not? Why not? We're separated unto him. Such were some of you, Paul wrote. But now you're justified and holified or sanctified and every other kind of fried. He, God, God doesn't want us to run some kind of a sinking ship with leaks all around. We can't be cheap about spiritual ministry. We can't act like we're doing something spiritual when we're full of the devil or full of self. We can't do that. It doesn't work. You can imitate it. You can imitate it. And, and I guess, I don't know. I, no, I, 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 can't, I was going to say thankfully, but it's not thankfully. It's not, it's not thankful. We shouldn't be thankful for the fact that we can get away with what Ananias and Sapphira got away with. Of course, we're not getting away with it. And in fact, it's, it has almost a worse, a, 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 a worse effect because it becomes infectious and people compromise all over the place. Whew. Fear comes on all the church. Chapter 6 is significant in one, one big word and one big way and that is they had to understand the principle of multiplication. Now they're winning people, and they're not just winning people, but they're discipling people, and they're not just discipling people. Now they see of a surety that they need help in spiritual ministry. They need to put people in positions of spiritual authority that are submitted to the vision of the church, and that's what they do. And the church, it says, it says specifically in verse number 7 of chapter 6 that the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and even a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. This thing was cooking again. They had sorted out the hypocrisy and now they're training people. They are beginning to equip them for the work of the ministry and things happen. When you equip the saints for the work of the ministry, things happen in the church. Just read Ephesians chapter 4. Members of the body all contributing their parts and the body builds itself up in love. That's the will of God. 
Praise God. Perfect. And that brings us to chapter number 7. But to begin, I mean, to go into 7, we've actually got to begin with the last verse, the last several verses of chapter 6. So excuse me, I'm actually crossing the lines here back over into 6 to get to 7, okay? Verse 6 and verse 11. They suborned men. These are the bad guys. These are the, the Jewish elders that don't like the church. They suborned men, which said, We have heard him, that Stephen, Stephen, who was one of the ones that's been multiplied, and he's become a deacon. He was appointed as a deacon in the church. We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Absolutely false. Absolute rubbish. Absolute, total, unadulterated rubbish. He's spoken against Moses and against God. And, of course, that stirs up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and they caught him and they brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak. All he talks about is blasphemous words. That's how bad it can get. My wife can tell you stories of, you know, of one nation that we were intimately involved in and, and one guy led this rebellious bunch out and, and just, I mean, he turned me, he turned me from, uh, in his mind and in his speech, he turned from me being, you know, the leader and the guy sent and, and helping us and developing new leaders, he turned me into an absolute devil. My wife can tell you about meetings. She sat in there and she had to go outside and, and so she couldn't hear it because she was just weeping to hear this stuff. And I was just sitting there letting this guy just pour out his poison. People can turn. People can turn in an instant if they're not given to God every single day. They're tempted by all kinds of evil. So they stirred up the council against Stephen. And they said, this man doesn't even cease speaking blasphemous words against this, this place, this temple, and against the law. Because we've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this temple. I mean, pulling something out of context and just... And he shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him. And what does it say in the last verse of 6? They looked steadfastly on Stephen and they saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel. Wow. I mean, they poured it out on this guy. He hasn't said a thing up till now. Stephen hasn't said a thing. They've just poured it out on him in heaps. They've called him everything under the sun. And then when they start to, to, to wind up some of their speech and they take another look at Stephen, it's as if he's got the face of an angel. And it all harkens back to Moses. It's like Moses coming down off of Sinai with his face shining, shining like the face of, of an angel. So much that he had to put a veil over his face to even look at the people, so that the people of Israel could even look at Moses. That's what they saw in Stephen's face. Because this was the will of God. And here's a man who's given completely to the will of God. He's not even defending himself. He's not even going to defend himself. Who he's going to defend is God. He's going to defend his Savior. He's going to stand up for what's right. But he honestly doesn't care about what happens to himself. Are you following me? Come on, all you people that want to sing about more grace, you want more grace? When are we going to get to this kind of grace? We're apostolic, right? We hear that all the time, don't we? We shout it from the hilltops. We're apostolic. People are making livings out of going around and telling everybody that we're apostolic again. Do they know what it means? Have they studied Stephen's stance? Have they discovered the seventh principle or the seventh stage of this development of the early church? Because it's right here in front of them. And all of chapter 7 is Stephen's defense, if you will. But he's not worried about himself. He's not worried about himself. Just read it. Read 7 for a, for just for the joy of reading it sometime soon. 
He tells the whole story. He tells the whole story. He even says, he says stuff that's so deep and it's just so, so, it's so anointed. In the middle of the chapter he says, Unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. But he doesn't make a big deal about Solomon's house. We, we still got people that make a big deal today about Solomon's house. But to this first church, they didn't care about Solomon's temple. Not the ones that knew God. Stephen has insight. Stephen has Holy Ghost understanding. Solomon built him in house, but the Most High, the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. He said that the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. So what house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? And then he wheels on these guys and he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you do always what you're doing all the time. In everything that you do is you're resisting the Holy Ghost. Just like your fathers did, so do you. Is he defending himself? No, he's getting himself in deeper. He's given more fodder for the cannon here. But he's not defending himself. <laughs> Do you know what? Read your history. Read your history of these apostolic fathers. And you'll find that one of their great desires, one of their greatest desires was to die like Jesus. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised. You're always resisting the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so to you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they've slain them which showed before the coming of the just one of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the dispensation of angels but you haven't kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to their very heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. I taught about godliness the other day, remember? And I said one of my favorite descriptions of godliness in that list in 2 Peter chapter 1 is the, it's the posture, it's the spiritual posture of always looking upward. I can see Stephen in front of his council just looking upward. He looks upward. He's probably in some room with his council, but he, he looks up at the ceiling or the roof of this, of this thing, but he sees beyond the roof of this building they're in. He looked steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God. In one of the last songs before the one about, about, uh, about the grace, we were singing about the glory of God. The glory of God. The, we, it, Glory to God. We sing it all the time. We say it in prayer all the time. Glory to God. But how does he really get glory? How does he really get glory from his church? It's got to be a church that's surrendered and submitted to him 100%. People doing the will of God above every other thing in life. I don't care about your ragged shoes, suits, cars, or the place that you live. I don't care. I don't care. I've been there. I know what it means. I know what it means to walk to church. I know what it means to walk to church with your son. I know what it means to walk to Bible studies. More than one in a night because we didn't have a car. And we walked to Bible studies. Why? Because we love God and we love the kingdom of God. No wonder I had holes in my shoes. Who cares? Who cares about your shoes? Who cares about your house and your cars and your, and your luxury and all this stuff that we've got? Who cares? I don't care what you've got, but don't be cheap in spiritual ministry. Don't cut it short. Don't be less than you are. Don't be less than, than the worth that Jesus paid the price for for you. He looked up and he saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold. He couldn't help but shout it out. 
to this backslidden bunch of Jewish elders. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He told them like he's what he saw. And they cried out with a loud voice. They said, stop this man. A loud voice and they stopped their ears. Because they were hearing, to them they were hearing blasphemies. And they're so holy, they can't hear, they can't listen to blasphemies. So they had to stop their ears. It would have made them unclean to hear this. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the confusion here? He's declaring Jesus to be the King of kings. At the right hand of God's power. The authority of God. God on the throne. In the the face of Jesus. It's what he's seeing. And they stop their ears so that they don't get unclean by hearing the truth. And they ran upon him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. They found those stones and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Who was calling upon God? Probably both groups. Stephen was calling upon God because he loved him. And they were calling upon God because they thought they were doing the right thing. But Stephen was saying, the difference was Stephen was saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then almost, it's almost too good to be true. The next verse is so wonderful. And he kneeled down under the pain and the blows and the bleeding and the weakness. He kneels down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, he's the Christ. He's like the Christ on the cross. He entered this place. Oh, for grace to trust him more. How are you going to enter into that grace? And he knelt down and he prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And I had to start a little bit before 7. And I got to finish a little bit after chapter 7. So you get the point. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And I promise you one thing. The man who later became the Apostle Paul never forgot that scene. He never forgot, he never forgot Stephen having the face like the face of an angel. And they kept stoning him. Saul wasn't stoning him, he was holding the coats. He was being the good junior guy. He was still in the apprentice stage maybe. But he watched it. And he must have wondered inside, how can you, how can you have a face of an angel? How can you pray like that? Lay not this, everybody else that we've ever stoned has cursed us to their dying breath. And this guy prays like the, like the one from Nazareth on the cross. Lay not this sin, don't, don't, don't lay this, don't blame them for this sin, God, because they don't know what they're doing. Okay, Grossbach, you've been on and on about seven, so, so what's the other one? What's the seventh one? It's humiliation. It's humiliation. I'm not a dictionary preacher. I'm not a dictionary preacher. But I got to bring the dictionary in on this one because humiliation and humility are two different words. I know they're like this. I know they're they're like twin brothers, but they're different. Humility can happen personally, and it needs to happen personally. And you'll never know what I mean about humiliation in chapter number 7 unless you begin to delve into real personal humility. You can practice humility. You can learn humility. You can learn life lessons and gain humility. God will give you chances. There's no question about this. I'm telling you the truth now. God will give you chances and places and times and opportunities where you can show humility. And what you do is up to you. And nine times out of ten, people choose the other way. They choose pride. 
They choose self-esteem or self-merit or self-dignity or self-worth over humility. And especially the humility that's required in the kingdom of God. But God will give you times and opportunities to demonstrate that you're learning personal humility. The Bible tells us that we ought to esteem others better than ourselves. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've ridden with I've ridden with Christians in cars that will do everything they can to beat another car from getting the parking spot nearest to the restaurant. And I don't laugh. Because I just wonder what in the world is all this about? Who cares if we got to walk? Who cares? I know Christians that just ignore the hurt in somebody else. Because they might have to do something that they don't want to do. So they don't humble themselves. I know Christians that won't repent in front of others. I know Christians that won't forgive others. They sit on their throne like God and they judge other people. And they never get off that throne long enough to say, I'm sorry. Because I'm worse than you are. Forgive me. God will give you times when you can learn humility, but it's up to you. And if you can't learn that, you'll never understand humiliation. Humiliation is different from humility because, like I said, humility can be a personal thing. It's a personal thing. It happens in here. Humiliation takes a third party. It takes somebody else perpetrating something against you. It takes an Acts 7 experience where they speak wrongfully of you. Where they run you down. When they spread rumors about you. I don't do social media. I I can email me if you give me, if you make it simple, I can email you back. I don't text unless it's absolutely imperative. I don't, I just don't, I don't, I'd rather talk to you on the phone. And I don't even get close to Facebook or, you know, tweeting people or whatever else they do. I don't care about that stuff. I don't want to be involved. I know I'm a dinosaur. That's the way I am. I know you've got to do it. I know it's about business. I know it's about getting ahead. I don't care about that. I want to be disconnected from it. But I do know that people are just crushed all the time because people treat them wrong on a social media in a medium where they don't even know the other person on the other side. They can't even be humiliated by strangers and get over it. Let alone people that you thought were near and dear but then let you down when push comes to shove. So I'm done. That's the way I look at the book of Acts revival, at least in Jerusalem. That's the way I see it. I think that's the way I'm always going to see it. And I think whatever I'm involved in and wherever that may be from this day forward, I think I'm always going to ask myself if those things are still applicable in my life, if I'm still applying those very very principles. Because if I'm not, then I'm not growing. I'm going backwards. I want to live for Him. I want to die for Him. If you make me a tombstone... If you have that sorry job of making my tombstone, just put it on there that he loved God. Because that's all I knew. But I love you too. I love this church. And the reason I preach so hard at this church, the reason I preach with passion, that I don't even know where this stuff springs from. I don't know where all these tears come from. I just feel so dearly about you. I feel so dearly about this congregation. I feel so dearly about the promises here. I feel so dearly about the leadership here that I don't want it cheapened or compromised by anything. I don't want you to... You know what? Every single apostle that writes an epistle in this New Testament right here, every single one gives multiple warnings about false teachers and preachers. And the minute the apostles left the scene, it started coming in. There were many tear stains on some of those 
some of those letters that they sent out to the churches, I promise you. Because they love those churches. Look at Paul's, look at Paul's passionate letter that we call the book of Romans. He's trying to get to Rome. He wants to get to Rome. He feels more than anything that he needs to be there. And the church is starting and he, he feels like they need guidance and he knows that there's divisions that are already beginning in the church at Rome. And if he could just get there, if he could just get to Rome, and all he can do is write a letter and it's just full of passion about these people doing the right thing and not going back to the law and not putting things on people that they don't need to have put on them. He's passionate about it. He cares. I can see the teardrops on the, on the letter. And then when he gets a chance to go to Rome for free, when he can get a free ticket by being falsely accused in Jerusalem, he says, that's the ticket. That's how I'll get to Rome. And he does. And when he gets there, they kill him. Oh, for grace to trust you more. Pastor Wright, stand, will you please? Come here. I love you. I do. I think you are, can I say the bomb? Does that apply to people? No. I think you're the guy. I think he's the man for this congregation. I do. I do. And I'll tell you something, in, uh, and I don't say this all the time, but I'm telling you this in the Holy Ghost. I know this. He needs to know now. It's not because of a discussion with him, by the way. This is not anything like that. This is just in the spirit, okay? He needs to know now more than ever, I suppose, just who's with him in this vision. Who's, who's willing to trust God for even more grace for this church? And if you're ready, that's what I'm talking about. That's... I can't talk yet. 